Hi, you're watching Green Planet, Blue Planet. I'm here today with Brad Rubenstein, the co-author of the book Risk Upfront, Managing Projects in a Complex World. And he's written this book with Adam Josephs. And Brad, I want to know all about how we bridge the tactical with the visionary, because that's what you and I speak about often. So first of all, welcome to the show and welcome to be here with me today. Thank you very much. Uh, glad to be here. Nice. Um, you and I have talked a lot about uh, the, uh, what it takes to make visions come alive. And um, I've been thinking a lot about this since, uh, since the book has come out. And so it's very much on my mind about uh, all these questions about what it takes to get people together to make visions come alive. So I'm it's, to talk about that. it's really curious to me because I interview people on purpose on, on vision quite a bit and I, I'm getting a clearer and clearer understanding of what it takes to form holistic visions, visions that are actually not just a creation of your own imagination, but visions that are kind of in line with, let's say, the, the tendency or the trajectory of consciousness, but then implementing those visions and making them real and carrying them out into the realm of action is what is most difficult for most people, I guess. So having you here is like having an expert of bridging those two worlds. Brad, I'd love to introduce you with a little bit more background because you and I um, were introduced through a mutual friend who actually has been on the show as well. His name is John Brancy. He's a, a singer and you both kind of met through the world of um, performance, I guess. Through the world of music. I uh, used to uh, be chairman of the board of the New York Festival of Song, which is an arts organization in New York that puts on uh, uh, song recitals uh, and I met John through that and I met you through John. Nice, yeah. And then the curious part about our relationship is that I brought Brad into our company actually to help us navigate and manage projects in this like increasingly complex world. And very much, uh, I remember it was a, like a tech startup, uh, very, very much related to San Francisco we were meeting in today. It was very much the question of how do you break down a vision into a tactile action plan, but then also how do you empower and encourage each individual on the journey to step into their best self to contribute to the vision. So maybe my first question for you, how do you deal with breaking people's illusions when you, <laughs> when, when, when you come into, into a company? It's a very good question. Let me back into it a little bit by um, talking a little bit about how I came to this problem and uh, um, a little bit more where I come from. Uh, I'm, uh, I've done music at uh, uh, both performance and production avocationally, but really I'm a software developer and a te uh, technical guy and I work with technical teams. Uh, I've done it here in Silicon Valley and I've done it in um, uh, New York. Um, and uh, after t midway through my career, I went from being a technical developer to a uh, manager of teams and someone who was leading development efforts in technology companies and things like that. And uh, I stopped doing that about 15 years ago and moved into a world with Adam Josephs where we were coaching teams of people on how to get things done. And uh, you can think about that in the technology world uh, where you have like product teams, but it really was an experience born out of teams that were trying to get theater pieces done and the teams that were trying to get movies done and teams that were trying to get political action done mm -hmm. as well as the more classical uh, project management for big projects. And what we realized in our work was that this notion that groups of people coming together mm -hmm. uh, to accomplish a goal together all have the same kinds of problems. And they all have the people problems of how do you uh, communicate and how do you talk to each other and how do you decide and uh, how do you articulate what you're trying to get done in such a way that a group is motivated to do it how do you deal with risks the book is called risk up front mm -hmm. it's a lot about risks how do you deal with projects that go off the rails 
And the very first part of that was uh, just starting to think about what is a project and what is a team. And that's, and we have a very general notion of what that means. Anything with a beginning, an end, and a measurable goal. Right. And that fits a huge number of contexts, right? It could be getting the kids off to school in the morning is a project, right? Totally. For, the, for and, parents, it definitely is. Yeah. And it's a beginning and end, a measurable goal. It's something that you may or may not be good at. Mm -hmm. It's something that might be risky or not risky, and you might have to you know, deal with it one way or another, but it's just as much of a project as you know, building a Boeing 747. It's just, it's a difference in scale, but the human interactions that apply have lots of similarities. And the problems that come up that people need to talk through have a lot in common. Very curious to me, because what I hear is that no matter if it's politics or economics or even just a family, that the human component is really what you and Adam broke it down to and really helped connect the human element to the productivity or the like reaching the goal? Yeah, let me, I mean, in a tech, we work a lot with companies and we yeah. work a lot with product development. So, and, and the book in its, you know, tries to do two things. It is a methodology and a way of thinking about getting projects done. And then it's just a lot of tactics. Right. And basically a recipe book for doing it like we coach people to do it. Um, and... Uh, that methodology is, um, what do I want to say, it's, it's rooted in behavioral and cultural notions, issues of uh, communication and uh, issues of um, the, the very issue of risk is, is a, and how we talk about risk yeah. is a cultural thing. There are, are groups of people for whom talking about risk is very threatening and difficult and dangerous. People don't want to be the bearer of bad news. Absolutely. And that uh, for all kinds of projects. And there are other environments, more we would say more productive environments generally, where risk is uh, bringing up and talking about risk is seen as good news. It helps right. teams dodge the bullet, right? Uh, and prevents a lot of problems because things don't get swept under the rug so So maybe let's start there. What does it mean to bring the risk up front? And, and how is it that that works? So we have a model for how projects work. Mm -hmm. and, and if you think of it as having a begin and an end and a measurable result, then there's some time frame over the life of a project. If you're putting on a theater show or if you are building a piece of software for the marketplace, uh, there's some time at which it begins, some time at which it ends, and over the course of that, the team, it, it may start with just being one person's idea. You get people together because it's too big for one person to do. Right. right? You, need, you need the collaboration. You need the collaboration. If you could do it yourself, you would, but you can't. Um, and uh, a very commonplace observation, which I think most people sort of intuit, is that when projects uh, fail when they go off the rails when they're big disasters uh, the what people notice is that they're going along working on their project and then somehow lightning strikes there's some big disaster uh, change of plans a customer goes away uh, a lead actor gets you know injured whatever it is and that throws the project into disarray and if that happens right towards the end of the project, it's very, very expensive to fix. If it happened towards the beginning of the project, and you had, say, three months or six months or a year to work on it, there's all sorts of things you could do. It's easier but to adapt, yeah. It's easy to adapt, it's cheaper. Mm -hmm. So there's this basic understanding that lightning strikes projects, and the later in the project the lightning strikes, the more expensive it is to fix. Uh, we take that as sort of a truism. Mm -hmm. And once you notice that, you notice something else that happens, and that is that um, a common way that projects happen is that people get an idea, and then 
Uh, they start working on the idea a little bit and they get a couple people around them to help flesh it out and then when they get a better idea of what the project is they start adding more people and then they find out that they need lawyers and they get the lawyers involved and then you know all sorts of different uh, team members right. uh, come into the mix and uh, they get more and more involved in the project and then deadlines start looming and they start to panic a little bit and their sense of urgency gets higher and higher and higher right. and then right before the deadline everyone is uh, working all night yeah. and gets everything done right before the deadline and there's that same sense that urgency starts low just like cost of disaster starts low and goes up slowly over the course of the project mm -hmm. and that is a problem for teams because if urgency is low at the beginning, then everyone will just sort of casually work on whatever they work on and there's no opportunity to, to notice the things that the team is blind about. There's no way to bring those things into the team's ability to take action. So for example, if you thought that an actor, you know, it's like nowadays, you know, we have experience with theater, so we know that at the beginning of the show you have an understudy. Mm -hmm. I still see projects, theater pieces fail for lack of an understudy sometimes, but mm, people who've done this before know that that's something they need, and so they think about that at the beginning. But if you were just putting the project together and you realized, oh, we need a person to do this role, so you hire an actor and you get, get that done, and then all of a sudden, uh, later on, lightning strikes because nobody had the foresight to say, what if the actor is unable to perform? What if they get totally. a cold, right? And when the actor does finally get a cold, uh, if you would ask the people in the room, did anyone think this would happen? Someone would have said, of course it, was good. it could have happened. Like, we've been on shows where this has happened before. Right. So someone knew it could happen, but for some reason, the team couldn't take action. They couldn't do anything about it. They swept it under the rug. They do this for two reasons. Um, one is that uh, at the beginning of a complicated project, people are a little bit overwhelmed by the number of things that need to ha that they know need to happen, right. let alone the things that they don't know they don't know. Mm -hmm. Which is usually the larger part, is the parts we don't even know it's about. Not that it's uh, not necessarily that it's larger, it's more dangerous. Fair right? enough, yeah. It's where the lightning comes from. Mm -hmm. And it's what an individual knows at the beginning is not the same as what the team knows. This is the strange thing about teams. Yes. An individual could know, oh, we should, we should take care of this potential problem so that uh, we can mitigate the risk, yeah. hire an understudy. But um, the team doesn't act. It just sort of gets swept under the rug. It sort of, uh, if you look at someone's schedule of all the things that need to happen, it's not anywhere on the schedule. So is it just because the team doesn't communicate well enough from the beginning, or is it that the hierarchy is part of what carries this sweeping under the rug phenomenon? People are uh, uh, optimistic procrastinators in their core. We find this, uh, especially in their behavior with each other on teams. Yeah. If you ask someone... Optimistic, optimistic, optimistic procrastinators. If you ask someone, what do you need to do to make this happen? They'll start saying, well, I'm good at this, I'm a professional in my field, and we're going to do this, and then we're going to do this, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do this. Right. And that's the set of things that needs to happen in order to get this result. Everyone nods their heads, and that's what you get. Now, if you asked, is that what needed to be done, they would say, yes, that's what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. But then if I ask the question, which often goes unasked, well, what might go wrong, right? That question doesn't naturally come up. And people are optimistic. They think that if they lay out the steps, one, two, three, four, that all will go well. Right. And in fact, often that's not the case. But it's supernatural. It's, we won't talk about the things that might go wrong. We'll just lay out the things we need to do. There's plenty there, right? We're going to be very busy getting yeah. those things done. So we'll, that's the optimistic part. The procrastinating part has to do with that sense of urgency. I have so much on my plate now, why would I add more stuff? Like, I don't, 
want to talk about things that might go wrong, like that we that the lead might get sick, because then I have to go out and find an understudy, and I'm so busy right now, I can't really afford the time. So that optimistic procrastination pair of I'm everything will I'll assume everything will go well. If I actually ask someone, do will everything actually go well? It's like, well, I don't know, maybe, maybe we, ne not. we never know. We that's the truth. Right. Yeah. So anyway, that's that's sort of the basis of the con whole conversation. Bringing risk up front is to Bringing have the it. conversation about risk right. before and, it actually occurs. And that's when when I'm working with teams, yeah. that's that's the core of the conversation. Is what do we need to talk about now, in order to make sure that in addition to all the stuff that you know you need to talk about. Yeah. What else do we need to talk about to keep the project from going off the rails? You see, the things it, that you're blind to. I think this is such a curious and at the same time like super important piece of any project. It could again be work, life, creating a movie, creating a theater play. Because you know nothing ever goes only as per plan. Right? Nothing ever goes exactly as you've planned it, even if you've laid out the steps really well. So I feel like it's almost like bringing to the awareness of the group or the community that is creating or collaborating what else might arise. It's just this piece of bringing it to the awareness. Is, is that basically the process of bringing risk up front? Um, so the, the trick, right? yeah. the, the thing that people... So everything that you said is right and everything that you said is actually the thing that people would latch on to pretty easily. Mm -hmm. The trick is that there's all of these team dynamics that keep right. that from happening that any one individual might say, oh that makes total sense, but for some reason it doesn't filter into the action of teams. Right. Well, that's the circumstance that you and I met in, actually, because I remember it was a startup environment, but it had a very uh, top-heavy kind of uh, governance and guidance. So a lot of people would have private conversations um, and agree on things, but once we were in the actual like productive professional environment, most people wouldn't speak up about what they just said on a coffee break five minutes earlier. So exactly, yeah. and, and the it, that was pretty pr prototypical. I'll I'll talk just a little bit about like how you actually may turn that corner. Mm -hmm. Because what we found is um, that it is, a, think of it as a cultural change, right? Yeah. It's a change in the way people behave in the team, on the team. And uh, sometimes it starts out being unnatural, although in our experience teams become, they get used to it fairly quickly. Um, and uh, you can't just ask a team or an individual for that matter to say, okay, we're going to do the risks at the beginning, or okay, um, uh, we, we work with them to establish uh, transparency, good mm -hmm. transparent communication right. in, on the team, transparency, accountability, that people really know what they're supposed to do, what they're supposed to own. Not mm -hmm. so much what they're supposed to do, but like, I'm on the hook to, to make sure this thing gets That's done. That's my responsibility, yeah. Yeah, and I may do none of the work, right? I may have to do pull all sorts of strings yeah. to make that happen, but I own it. Totally. And um, so uh, transparency, accountability, integrity, in, not in the sense of personal integrity, but integrity in the sense of doing what you say. And the team doing what it says. So that if the team says, we're going to get something done this week, we actually make sure it gets done and, and notice yep. that it gets done transparently. That things don't happen uh, or not happen quietly in the background. And the fourth thing, fourth thing these are four principles mm. of risk up front, is commitment. And that is that people make commitments yeah. th and they do what they say. That is, that if someone says, something will be done, yeah. then it will be done. If they say, I own it, then they really do own it. If they set a deadline, they will meet that deadline. And if you're going to, it's not, the change in behavior is not, I'll do my best, right? Right. Because what if your best isn't good enough, right? What the minimum, I, I would guess, you'd have the responsibility to communicate that uh, up front to say, you know what, it's Thursday afternoon, I'm not going to meet my Friday deadline. 
Um, now, now how can we... Much better to do that Thursday afternoon than to do it Friday at 5. Exactly. Right? After no the deadline's form of dead. Adapting is, Especially is if people over. are depending on you. Yeah, like, yeah. Other people have flexibility. They have an extra day to, rec to recover. So I feel like this is almost like you're applying it in the professional and entrepreneurial environment or context. But as you s started out saying, it's very much also relatable to everyday life occasions. Because if I'm not doing what I'm saying, or if I'm out of integrity with my own voice, I have this steady work to do of cleaning up my own lies and my own inconsequences. And it actually, out of my own life experience, I can say it makes life quite complicated when I'm missing that mark. And when I, I'm on that mark, what I've learned is life seems to reward you because it says, look, you're, you're doing what you said you were doing. And it kind of, for me, the experience of freeing up more capacity actually comes through honoring my own word and it had I had to learn to say no I, I can't do this which sure uh, for a long while I would have never said that I'd be like no I'll try I'll try but being able to say no I can't do that actually freed me up to stay longer in integrity with my own word that's the big leap that teams make as a team mm -hmm. is to move from saying I'll try my best to saying it will be so and it may be for fewer things right right because now you have to actually account for the things that might go wrong totally um, the other thing we notice is that teams often will start approaching this conversation kind of from a moralistic point of view like it's moral to have integrity mm -hmm. uh, and we view it very much as a workability issue that if if people are if people are able to rely on you then more gets done Things get done faster. There are fewer breakdowns, M mechanically. It's, so, um, will uh, this is also not hard for teams to get, and uh, uh, it makes a lot of sense. And it That's matches right. kind of what you said. It's stuff. The the less you have to clean up, mm -hmm. the um, the more capacity you have. And in teams, we talk about velocity. Yeah, like the agile sense of velocity. You have more teams have more velocity that way. Very, very sweet. Thank you, Brad, for going a little bit deeper into risk up front and the philosophy that kind of stands behind it. I'd love to ask like a personal question or two just to get deeper into, into your um, vantage point as, as well, because I know your background is so diverse. You, you've dealt with voice and singing, theater, produced movies, you've worked with lots of companies. Um, I know that you've worked in companies like Goldman Sachs on the East Coast. So you definitely have kind of covered the whole spectrum of very tactical and pragmatic to all the way to creative. And what, I, what I'd be curious to hear is what are like a takeaway lesson or two that you've learned about being the most authentic human being you can be in that kind of fluctuating environment? Right. So I'm very clear that my passion is related to facilitating process. It sounds a little mechanical, mm -hmm. but it's really um, providing the grease in the wheels for things to happen, for change to happen, right? For art to get made or for products to get delivered. Got it. And the teams that I work with all are, they have their particular passions about uh, the thing that they're trying to build or the the art they're trying to make, mm -hmm. whatever those things are. And um, I feel like, personally, I can latch on to those that excitement. I love latching on to that excitement wherever it is. But uh, I'm, m for myself, mostly interested in making sure it happens. So providing the space for it? Uh, it's a, it, partly, it's providing the space, but also when you watch teams do what they do naturally, there's, especially teams that are just coming together for the first time, mm. there's a lot of floundering that happens. Right. And it's yeah. very easy for me to take a facilitator's role, something I do naturally, and say, you know, gently or not, uh, this, here, here's a workable process that will get you to where you want to go. And uh, if, uh, if it's an environment where we all know a lot about the process, then usually it's just a tweak of what they experts already know they need to do. Mm -hmm. I work with people who are usually already experts. Yeah. 
And so it's just a tweak on cleaning up some things that might cause disaster later. And uh, when people notice that, they light up and then I light up and projects and get more, done. More and authenticity and, and getting things done and, and checked is, is basically kind right. of like a natural byproduct. Uh, uh, it's measured, right? It's we, measured. Yeah. We're, we're kind of like, if you had to get organized about anything, get organized about that. Right. Just this is the funny part about interviewing you because I know that we offline without the cameras rolling, we've connected lots about ideas or um, stories or narratives or, or visions, right? But then you're actually a very tactical person who very much understands the mechanical process of what humans go through when they are actually creating a project. I think you and I have talked about this that there are starters and finishers. Yeah. So with some, I, I, I always pair up with other people. Adam Josephs and I are like yin and yang this Compliment. way also. Yeah. Um, and uh, another way to look at it is sometimes you have scientists and engineers. Scientists think about you right. know, theorems and structures and models. Engineers think about making sure the bridge doesn't fall down mm -hmm. and making sure that you know the the parts get ordered and arrive on time so uh, so that the bridge can get built. Um, so super, super I'm interesting. more of an engineer. Yeah. Adam is more of a scientist. You know. Uh, and the compliment makes it happen. And the compliment. I makes think it this happen. is the this is the gold nugget that I was kind of like poking around to get is because often we. Um, we either try to do all of it ourselves or we create teams that are not necessarily complementary to each other. And the more complementary you're saying a team is when you have the starter and the finisher, then you're actually starting to, to, to match. Um, people who are new to team projects mm -hmm. or people who are coming together for the first time, a lot of these people that I work with are engineers who, who believe deeply in principle that anything that needs to be done, they could do. Right. <laughs> it's that it's that sort of I can conquer the world or software eats the world is a very common feeling and the notion that you have to divide up the work or you need people who are good for other things than what you're good at uh, to make the project successful is kind of a you know one step up on the maturity level of teams totally. um, and oftentimes the very first con conversations that I'll have with any team are um, what who needs to be in the room who is not here like for lack of a person who's good at this particular thing this project will run off the rails why don't we get that person in the room now rather than six months from now just so that they could say you know that what you're doing is totally crazy and you should change it in these five ways you know what you're sharing to me sounds like it's so intuitive and at the same time and somewhat logical once you express it that eloquently but at the same time, I've been in lots of teams where none of these like kind of pillars were set in place at the beginning. It always came up when it came up because, as as you just explained, there was this form of it's that curve optimistic <laughs> procrastination going on. So if you're having optimistic procrastination happening in your life, um, see how to bring the risk right into the now moment and, and explore it before it turns expensive, either through money or like just cleaning up after yourself, right? Yeah. I'd love to ask you another question though. Sure. Having this vantage point onto groups coming together and human interaction, for you personally, what is your the notion of happiness? What does that really where does that ring a bell? Or what is happiness to you? So I, I think there's a micro answer and a macro answer. Yeah. Um I uh a, a micro thing that I love to do is to facilitate meetings and facilitate conversations. It's a little bit of a um uh specific mm. thing but um, the reason I love that is because uh, I like watching those aha moments happen those non-linear things that an individual couldn't do but a team can do yeah uh, and it's a it's that kind of magic that I want to be around um, and uh, I try and get one of those out of every meeting often you know it's like one aha moment and I like, I'm happy, it's like, okay, now... Aha all, moment all, e equals happiness. Right. Not to make it overly complicated, but basically what I want to know from you is, let's say the process of the future, since it's unknown, is not the, the focus point of this question. It's more about what is a world that you can imagine becomes possible when humans operate in a collaborative field, 
when humans are kind of like in your book are taking risk and what could go wrong into account while we're creating a world with each other? The risk part of the equation is to prevent disasters from happening that are expensive or impossible to fix. Right, like let's say a war for example, right? Could yeah. be one of those disasters that if we had a holistic vision, if we don't have need for war, if we have singular country visions, war might be a plausible scenario. So the question is, um, uh, what does it look like in the future that's different in the past? Mm -hmm. Because we have 10,000 years of human history that you know, are full of wars and uh, famines yeah. and technological progress mm -hmm. and iPhones. Right, so the uh, uh, and carbon dioxide in the air. Right, so uh, those those the we've always had these challenges, and so if you want to look at what the future is going to look like, it has to be it seems to me uh, one level higher. That is, it's not about uh, a specific agreement. I don't know what that agreement would look like, and it's not about a specific overcoming a particular problem. Although I have my suspicions that, you know, if we don't overcome global warming and carbon dioxide, then we have... New catastrophe, right. new risk, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you know, a risk is something that might... A risk is something that might happen. Mm -hmm. We It's a very common thing. If someone says, you know, we have this problem, if I'm on a team to deal with the future, and someone says, uh, I think that uh, the planet uh, is going to uh, not support life because there's too much, there will be too much carbon dioxide in the air. It's like, that is not a risk. That's a problem. Yeah. That's not something that might happen. That's something that will happen. Unless we change something. Unless the way we behavior. change yeah. something, right? So uh, that's, that's, you know, a prop, risks are different than problems to solve, right? You have totally. to solve those problems or... Uh, you go off the rails. I like your answer, Brad, because where I'm hearing you answering is exactly the place that I asked this question from in the first place. Is I don't know what the, the future will hold. I don't know what all the risks will be in the future. Neither do I know what the humanity we know will turn into. All I do know is that in those 10,000 years of history, what we did not have is like a collective plan, a collective ideal of the Earth. We had different isolated wishes and desires for power, but we don't think we actually ever had, um, like, again, I don't know how the agreement would even look, but I don't think we ever actually had a, a shared vision of a holistic, healthy environment that is not just up for grabs and taking, but is actually offering itself for collaboration to birth, innovation to birth, you know, like the next level of human existence. It, it, I, I want to end with a little bit of a story. Yeah, please. Um, sometimes when I'm working with a team, the team is saying, lining up all the things they need to do to get where they're going to go. Mm -hmm. And they know they have a difficult, oftentimes teams work, uh, I work with are doing very cutting edge things and it's not even clear that the physics will work for the what they're trying to build, right? That big risks. Uh, built into the very center of what they're trying to accomplish. And all they know when they're planning is that they're going to have to throw that plan away and plan something else. And they'll often ask me, well, why should we bother planning if we know this plan is not something we're going to follow? And there's a really good answer to this, and that is that the team that has a plan and follows it and then comes to a point where they need to pivot or turn or change or substitute a different plan is in a better position than the team that doesn't plan at all and right. goes off in 20 different directions and, they, and the very idea of a change of plan can't happen. Totally. So when, when you think about what the, what the world looks like and you think about what a common vision is, my intuition is you may never get a common vision. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean it's not useful to talk about or plan for yeah. because that's a necessary step to being able to pivot to wherever you're going and adapt to wherever you're going to go. You know, 
you could come up with a world vision and the Earth can get his, hit by an asteroid, right? Right. No guarantees. And yet, uh, if uh, the number of situations you can adapt yeah. to is just better if you have a common understanding of where you are. Again, I love your answer. I think this, I feel more exposed than usual. Uh, this might be because we're sitting on the same couch, but it's also, <laughs> it, yeah, it might also be because we've had similar conversations before and it's, it's really not about the one state of the vision. For me asking, it's about the quest of learning how to navigate towards a compass and then learn to adapt in the process. I, and I think that that is the common thing, yeah. right? Because whenever you're taking on something big and complicated and risky, you aren't sure where you're going to end up and you're not sure where the conditions are going to be and there are no guarantees. Mm. Uh, the very best position you can be in is to be honest and, and transparent and, uh, and you know, uh, be in, uh, have good communication. Uh, those are fundamental things. Everything else builds on top of that. Beautiful. Accountability, well, integrity, transparency, commitment. Those are the four base, base values. Well, Brad, thank you for taking the time to be here with me today. Where can people that find? Was yeah, it was. <laughs> Where can people find your book, Risk Upfront? Uh, it's uh, you can Google Risk Upfront and you'll see it. It's on Amazon. Uh, Barnes and Noble has it. Nice. All major bookstores. Excellent. Is there anything else you'd like to share with people right now? Um, I think I'm good. If, if you do like it and you want to contact me, is that possible? Totally. Yeah. You can send email to info at riskupfront.com. Info at riskupfront.com? Yeah. Get in Let me know what you're saying. Perfect. Well, Brad, thank you so much again. This was a fun half hour.